if you have already, if you don't know, October is recognized as Pastors Appreciation Month. So we ask that as we prepare for this special month, that you continue to keep our pastors and their families lifted in prayer. I Work Chicago Job Fair. Due to low registration, the I Work Chicago Job Fair has been canceled. However, plans to host next year in April 2020 is underway. So if you would like to be a part of that or need more information, please contact Eric Derek Winston for more details. Goshen's Prayer Circle continues every night at 7 o'clock p.m. Please dial in as we cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. The call-in number is 605-313-4199, and the code for that number is 783721-POUND, and it is located in your bulletin. Loads of Love continues to need your financial blessings as they bless the community. Please support your Loads of Love by weekly or giving through your weekly tied envelope marked Loads of Love. And we appreciate all of your support. If you would like to donate any used clothing items or small utensils, please contact Sister Alva Martinez, and that your donations greatly help out with the church. For further details and upcoming events in the bulletin, please look towards your bulletin. <laughs> Thank you and happy Sabbath. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, can we clap our hands in the household and just begin to give God praise? Come on, it's another Sabbath day the Lord has afforded us to see. And we're going to come into his presence with singing and thanksgiving and giving praise. Come on, can we stand to our feet and just begin to clap our hands in the house? Come on, let's invite his presence in. Father, we lift our hands and we lift our voice and we say that you are welcome here. Tabernacle here with us today, Father. Hallelujah. We give you glory. We create an atmosphere of praise. We create an atmosphere of praise. Sing a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Move. Move Holy Spirit in this place. Come on, come we sing that together. We say we create an atmosphere of praise. 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 Sing a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Move Holy Spirit. Move Holy Spirit in this place. Oh, 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 we sing a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Move Holy Spirit. Come on, let's invite his presence in. We cry, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing a hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing a hallelujah, hallelujah. Move Holy Spirit. Move Holy Spirit in this place. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. We say, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Sing, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Sing, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Move Holy Spirit. Move Holy Spirit in this Oh, sing it again, we cry, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Sing, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Oh, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Move Holy Spirit. Move Holy Spirit in this place. We invite you in, Lord. We cry, you are worthy. 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 Move Holy Spirit. Move Holy Spirit in this place. Oh, we say you are worthy. You are worthy. Say you are worthy. You are worthy. Say you are worthy. You are worthy. Move Holy Spirit. Move Holy Spirit in this place. 
Come on, let's make some declarations today. We say, you, you shall be healed. You shall be healed. You shall be filled. You shall be filled. You shall be changed. You shall be your changed. life rearranged. Life rearranged. You shall be healed. You, you shall be healed. You shall be filled. You shall be filled. You shall be, filled. You shall be changed. You shall be your changed. Your life rearranged. Life rearranged. You shall be healed. You shall be healed. You shall be filled. You shall be filled. You shall be changed. You shall be your life. Life rearranged. Life rearranged. You shall be healed. You shall be healed. You shall be filled. You shall be filled. You shall be changed. You shall be your life rearranged. Life rearranged. Sing a hallelujah. 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 Quite hallelujah. Hallelujah. Move Holy Spirit. Move Holy Spirit. Come on, I sing it. Sing move Holy Spirit in there. Move Holy Spirit. We cry. Move Holy Spirit. We say move Holy Spirit in this. We sing move Holy Spirit in this. We sing move by your power divine. Say move Holy Spirit in this. Touch him and deliver Jesus. Move Holy Spirit in this. Set our souls on fire. Move Holy Spirit in this. Give us what we need. Say move Holy. We surrender to your way to the Lord. We want you to take control, Lord. Move, Holy Spirit. Sing, move, Holy Spirit. in this. Sing, move, Holy Spirit. in this. Move, Holy Spirit. in this place. Come on and clap your hands if you want to see a move. We invite you in to move, Lord. Oh, Let us bow our heads and close our eyes as we welcome the Holy Spirit in this place. Oh, oh Father, Lord, we're so grateful today, Lord. You, you have ordained another day, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that you are in this place with us. We pray that everyone that walks upon this stage today is inspired by your Holy Spirit to speak, Lord God. We pray that you fill this place. Touch the hearts, prepare the people to hear your message today, Lord God. And we pray that it resonates such that they are up and moved, Lord God, to do a thing for you, to have a relationship with you, to build on their heavenly place with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Good morning again, and happy Sabbath. I'm here to welcome you to the best place to worship Jesus. Amen? Amen. Do we have any visitors? All right. So, my name is Tamala Mann. Thank you. I've been called that three times this week, and that's all right. My real name is Lauren Denise Burton. I'm going to let you know a few things, because we family, right? So I am a descendant of Mary Frances Burton and Theodore Roosevelt Burton, who is a descendant of Abraham Reynolds and Callie Frances Reynolds Jones who is a descendant of Alex T. Jones and Hattie Mae Jones, who are descendants of Adolphus Jones and Francis Cooper Jones. Adolphus Jones was born in 1873, so we go back a long ways. But my daddy, my daddy is Jesus. And so I believe that your daddy is Jesus, which means we're all family. So you don't have to be welcome anymore because you are in the right place. Amen? So welcome to Goshen, SDA Church, where we are all family. Please get up and greet each other. Right here we say welcome to 
Welcome to Goshen, where the worshipers arise. Welcome to Goshen, let the worshipers arise. Welcome to Goshen, let's lift God high. You are welcome in this place. Come experience His grace. Welcome to Goshen, Goshen is the end. Welcome to Goshen, where the worshipers arise. Welcome to Goshen. Let's lift God high. You are welcome in this place. Come experience His grace. Welcome to Goshen. Welcome to Goshen. Welcome to Goshen. Welcome to Goshen. You are welcome. 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 Welcome to Goshen. Goshen is here. He loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red and yellow, blue and white. All our children. Hold your dollars high for the children to see. Children, when you get the money, don't forget to say thank you. Children of the world, we love the little children of the world. Thank you all. Good morning, boys and girls. Y'all look so beautiful today. All right. The title of our story today is He Will Come. And the Bible verse says, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. Isaiah 26, 4. Ice pressed against the little ship from all sides. The captain, Sir Ernest Shackleton, and his crew 
did everything they could to free the endurance, but nothing helped. The ship was being crushed. They had to take what they could what they could and go out onto the ice. Now, what should they do? The 27 men in Shackleton's crew had plowed their way through 1,500 miles of ice. And now they were stranded in an iceberg in the middle of the ocean, hundreds of miles from land. The brave crew set up tents and began to think of a plan. No matter how worried he was on the inside, Shackleton never complained. He remained brave, calm, and cheerful. They had three small boats with them, and after three days of thinking, he decided to take the biggest boat and five of his men and try to reach a whaling station 800 miles away. It was their only hope. He promised his men he would be back and after several months and hardship, he did come back. Later, the stranded men told him that each day, Frank Wilde, who was left in charge, told them, perhaps the boss will come back one day. When they finally saw the boat, they instantly recognized their boss and cheered. They had been on the island for more than four months and had suffered terribly, but they knew their boss would come back just as he promised. They knew that he was a man of his word and could be counted on to do what it took to rescue them. Jesus, our boss, is a man of his word too. He can be trusted to do what he says. Sometimes it may seem that it's taking a long time for him to come back and rescue us from this island of sin. But he promised, and he will come for us. Will you recognize him when he gets here? Okay. Can we stand in a circle? And I'm going to ask for two volunteers for prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this day that you have given us as your cornerstone church. Thank you, God, for you coming back as you promised to. Amen. Amen. You may go back to your seats. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everyone. Hallelujah. In the 34th division of Psalms, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It goes to say, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us, the people of God, exalt his name together. Here's one of my favorite verses. I sought the Lord and, he, Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. It says they looked upon him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Here's another good one. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. If you go down to the 22nd verse, the last verse of the passage, it says, The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trusteth in him shall be desolate. Now that's encouraging to me because it says, As long as you trust in him, the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him 
shall be desolate. We shall not lack anything. We shall not want for anything. We don't have to uh, beg for anything. He redeemeth us. We trust in him. And we shall. Is anybody glad about that promise today? Come on, if you're glad about that promise, can you begin to clap your hands and stand to your feet and begin to shout unto God with the voice of triumph? Come on, we can do better. The, set, the beginning of the song, we're going to bless the Lord at all times. And His praise shall continually be in our mouth. So can you just begin to put praise in your mouth and begin to let it flow from your mouth like a well of living water. Father, we bless you. We magnify you. You are good and your mercy endures forever. You are good and your mercy endures forever. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah in the room. Come on, shout hallelujah. Come on, just begin to clap those hands in the room. We've come to magnify the name of Jesus. We've come to lift his name high in the room. Oh God, you are worthy of our glory. You are worthy of our praise. Come on, sing this. We sing, Come on, church, raise it. We sing, Come on, you can clap your hands right there. Sing, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Come on, this is for those who believe it. Sing, Lord, you are good, yeah. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Come on, cry. Sing, Lord, you are good, yeah. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Let's raise this together. Sing, people from every nation. People from every nation.
so good, yeah. So good, so good, yeah. Say so, so good. So good, so good, yeah. 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 Say yes, you are, yes, you are, yes, you are. Yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. Say yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. Yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. Yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. Yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. Yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. Yes you are, yes you are. Listen, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Lift your voice, say God. God is good all the time, all the time, all the time. Say God is good. God is good. Sing when I'm up. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Church, can we raise that together with our hands lifted? Sing. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Come on, sing it directly to the Father. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. We worship your name, sing, Lord. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. We sing this song to you, Lord. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Now, come on, just take 30 seconds to let praise fill the room. Come on, with every hand lifted and a heart of and just begin to give God your best right now. Come on, just begin to let thanksgiving flow from your lips for his goodness, for his kindness, for his mercy, for his unfailing, unwavering, unconditional love. Father, we lift our hands and we say thank you this morning. Thank you for being God. Thank you for being our friend. Thank you for being our savior. Thank you for being our father. Thank you for being our keeper. Thank you for being our sustainer. Thank you for being our strong tower. Thank you for being the one who keeps our mind in perfect peace. Thank you for being the God we can trust in. Thank you for being the God we can rely on. Thank you for being the God we can lean on. We thank you for being thank God you, all by yourself. You, and we lift our hands and we lift our voices and we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We've come for no other reason but to say thank you, Lord. We see trouble on every side, but thank you, Lord. Thank you. On the days we don't feel the best, thank you, Lord. No matter what we face, thank you, Lord, because we know that if you have brought us to it, you will bring us through it. You are the God of the impossible. You are the God who holds understanding. You are wiser than we are. You are stronger than we are. You are higher than we are. So we submit ourselves to you. We abase ourselves before you. And we submit to you. Thank you, Jesus. This moment, we say we present our bodies as living sacrifices. May we be holy and pleasing into your sight. For we know this is our reasonable act of service. This is the way we really worship you. So here we are, Lord. Light of the world. You step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a 
life spent with you. Oh, come on, let's raise it together. We say, here I am to worship. Come on, sing it. Here I am to bow. Sing, here I am to say. Here I am to say. You're my God. You're my God. You're altogether lovely. You're altogether lovely. Forever you were. Altogether worthy. Lord, you want. Come on, raise it again with your hearts, amen, and here I am, say, here I am to worship, Father, here I am, here I am to bow withholding down. nothing, here I am, here I am to say, forever you're my you're God, my God. you are all together love, you're all together love, you're all together worthy. all together Oh, so I highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Oh, oh, humbly you came to the earth you created, and all for love's sake became.
come out with one voice. We cry, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Come on, church, lift it. You're all to. You're all together. You're all together, word. All together, wonderful. One more time, sing here I am. Church. Happy Sabbath, everybody. We have entered into a space in our service where we have an opportunity to go before the Lord. I don't know about you, but the week, the past month, has been rough for me. A couple weeks ago, I started the week on Monday, found out a co-worker had passed away. And Friday, my best friend got into a car accident, but God. She was in pain, but she was okay. Working in education, my students have been dealing with their own stuff. And my husband and myself being in the home, trying to work with them and praying for them and covering them, it, it takes a toll. And also, Thursday was World Mental Health Awareness Day. There is so much going on in the world today, and I think right now, right here, we should press together so that we can go before the Lord and just ask for his covering upon ourselves, our family members, and our church. So if you would like to press forward to the altar, I welcome you. If you want to stay in your seats and kneel where you have more room, you can do that too. Also, we were notified this morning that Al Ballard's mother, Diane, is going into surgery today. And he is asking for prayer. Sister Barry is also asking for prayer on her family. And so as we press together, we're going to go before the Lord. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We are coming to you, O oh God, on this Sabbath morning to ask for your blessing, for your covering, and for your forgiveness. The world we are living in at this current time was not designed for us. But we are just trying to make it through. We're trying to do the best we can, but again, we didn't die for our sins. You did. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us, so God, we are begging, pleading, and desiring for your intervention. Our mental health is wavering. Sometimes our faith is wavering as well, but we are too ashamed to say, hey, Oh God, I need you. But right now I am standing here, Lord, in the midst. There's been enough crying, dying, lying, shame, criticism, gossip, stealing. We carry so much pain and baggage that when we come to you, we are so worn, torn, that we can't even lift our hands to say, God, we are so worn by the, by the daily tolls and trials that when it's time for praise and worship, we don't even know what to do because we are so tired. I'm asking you all, oh God, to be with Sister Ballard as she goes into surgery today. Be with the doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, everybody in that room, cover them, and let your will be done. 
be with Sister Mary and her family, take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. Give her the strength as she leads her family. Give her the strength and the courage it takes to continue praying on her family's behalf. And Lord, as the world around us recognizes the importance of mental health, ask Lord to cover us. Give us a peace that passes all understanding. Strengthen our minds, our bodies, our hearts. Be with the members who wanted to be here but couldn't. Be with the members who are sick and shut in, and I ask you all, God, to give them courage. Give them the strength and healing that it takes and requires to return. Be with each and every one of us here, oh God, under the sound of my voice. And if there's anything within me that is blocking this prayer, I ask you, Lord, to wipe it out. Because it's needed. Our families need it, our kids need it, our schools, our churches. We need it. And if, dear Lord, if there's anything that I have forgotten to ask of you, please know it. We need it. We love you. We praise you and we thank you. Let everyone under the sound of my voice say amen. It just, just goes, Lord, I hear of showers of blessings. Thou art scattering full and free. Shows the third. Let some drops now fall on me.
won't you let some drops now fall on me? and open your mouth and receive it. Come on. Praise opens the gates. Praise opens the gates. Come on, can the room down with praise? Come on, if you're looking for the Lord to rain down, just begin to open your mouth and say hallelujah. Just begin to let the room resound with praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we give you glory. place I need a little help this morning I need the every hour most great us, Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need the oh, I need thee. Songwriter says, I need the every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need. Oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. Last verse says, I need thee every hour. Teach me thy will. And thy rich promises in me fulfill. I need thee. 
I need thee every hour I need thee oh bless me now my Savior I come to thee I if you've ever needed help before. When your spouse can't do it, your children can't do it, the job can't do it, Congress can't do it, no one in the White House has the power to do it. And the world can't do it for you. But when we're smart enough to lean on the shoulder of Jesus, just knowing that we have a friend in Jesus, when I can't tell my secrets to my friend, I have a friend in Jesus. When no one else can understand what's going on with me, I have a friend named Jesus who is able not only to understand me, not only able to see what's going on, but he's a friend that says that I will walk with you through whatever it is that you're going through. And as long as you're with me, everything is going to be all right. I don't know who needs encouragement this morning. But if you came to this house feeling heavy burden, just have an understanding that we serve a God who may sit high and looks low. But the word of God tells us that he is closer than a brother. And in my moment of sadness and despair, he is my joy. He is my peace. And if we would just lean on him, everything would be all right. This morning, I have a short message for you message that may come off as rebuke, but it's a message of encouragement. So let it not get twisted. This word is not from the preacher. This word is from the Lord. It's not from me, but it's for me. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And if you would just rest on your feet with me as we read God's word together. I know that there is some encouragement that God would like to share with his body of believers. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It's available on your screen. The word of God says, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. 
So because you are lukewarm, what are you? And neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. White clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed. An ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and do what? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Hallelujah, somebody. Just as I have, I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who hears, has have ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray. Father in heaven, let your words be heard. Let hearts be open and receptive to what you have to say to us. And we promise, oh God, we will hear, we will answer the call, and we will be true to what you've called us to be. This we ask in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to ask you a question this morning. Can you imagine a church that makes Jesus sick? Can you imagine being a church that makes Jesus sick? That is the position that the Laodicean church found itself in. Laodicea is a church, one of the most famous churches in the Bible. Unfortunately, they're not known for very good things. What was going on at Laodicea was not pleasing to the Lord. The church was in trouble. They were in trouble and didn't even know it. As we dive into God's word this morning, I want to examine this church, Laodicea, a church in trouble. We need to make sure as a body of believers, we ourselves don't fall into what this church did. There have been many churches that have fallen into the same state as this church. Many of those churches are gone. Many others no longer are effective for the Lord. They've dried up into a shell of what they were at one time. It is important for us that we learn a lesson from this church that's in trouble. So let's talk about what their problem is. What is the problem with Laodicea? What is it that made them so unpalatable that Jesus spit them out? Word of God says that they were lukewarm. What were they? Lukewarm. Now, how many of you have shopped at Starbucks? Anyone? Don't be ashamed. They got hot chocolate there. Y'all shopped at Starbucks? They got good cookies too, I hear. 
very good cookies. They got pastries and things. It's very nice. They're not Panera, but they're good. Now, many of you in your BC life, and when I say BC, I mean before Christ, you know, before you were converted, you know. Y'all get your coffee and your frappuccinos. Some of y'all still get your frappuccinos and your coffees and your hot chocolate like myself. And you understand that when you go there, there's many varieties of different kind of beverages that you can get. Am I right? So when you get a drink there, say you're getting hot chocolate or coffee, whatever it is that you're getting. You never ask for a lukewarm drink, do you? No, because that is nasty. It's disgusting. Have you ever drank cold chocolate that was supposed to be hot? It don't work. It don't taste the same. You either get hot chocolate or cold chocolate. You're not going to get that middle ground because that tastes spoiled, doesn't it? Oh, what is Jesus saying to his church? You're nasty. You're disgusting. You're stale. The word of God says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. But this lukewarm mess you've given me is nasty. And God uses an analogy that we understand. We don't like to heat up food and then let it sit and then eat the the lukewarm food. Because that doesn't taste very good, does it? God says that you are stale. The Laodicean church was a stale church. They had lost their freshness and didn't even understand it. They were about to be spit out by Jesus. Many of our churches are stale today. They've lost their freshness. They've gotten away from the things that pleases God. So the question remains, what has the Laodicean church done? Let's talk about the cause. At the time that this message was sent to the Laodicean church, this Church, this city that was surrounding the church was known around the region for four things. How many things? Four things. The first thing they were known for, they were known as the banking and trade center of the area. That's number one. The second thing they were known for, the city was a wealthy city. Third thing, they were known for their fine black wool cloth produced there. The last thing they were known for was they were known for the eye ointment made in the city. Jesus says to this church, now that we have an understanding of what it is that made them great at one point, Jesus said that this church had become content. What did they become? Content. They said that we are rich. We don't need anything. We are happy with where we are at. They didn't need Jesus anymore. They were happy with their own efforts and thought that they had made it and they had arrived. They have gone completely away from what Jesus had taught them and they were depending on what they knew and what they were doing. Sound familiar? They had literally kicked Jesus out of the church. And they didn't even realize it. But Jesus came and gave them a warning and a wake-up call through this word. He tells them how they really are. He tells it like he sees it. He says they are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. 
that's how we as a body of believers look to Jesus when we get content. That's how we look to Jesus when we try to have church without him. That's how we look when we do things we want to do and ignore the things that God wants to do. We look pitiful, blind, naked. So what is the solution? Jesus gives the Laodicean church a solution to their problems. He says it in his word. He says he tells them to buy gold from him. Remember what they're known for. They're known for their banking and their trade. Jesus says, you need to stop buying gold from other people. I wish somebody was with me here this morning. He tells them to buy gold from him, to get their riches from him. He tells them to buy clothes from him, clothes that will last. He tells them to buy eye ointment from him, ointment that they were creating was to heal physical blindness. But Jesus is saying, your physical eyesight is fine, but you need to get some ointment from me because your spiritual blindness is in full effect. You need to buy ointment from me that truly heals blindness. Do you see what Jesus is saying to his church? He's telling them to turn from what they produced without him and take a hold of what he can give them. Everything produced by our own efforts passes away. But everything produced by the power of God lasts forever. What do you say? We cannot grow a church by ourselves. We can't accomplish kingdom things without the king running the show. And we can never be content with where we're at. If we're not letting Jesus be the source of everything we do, we have failed as a church. It is only by depending on him that his will can be accomplished in his church. We have to be a church that is totally dependent on him. We can never sit back and say, hey, we, we, we did it. We did it all. We've arrived. We built a beautiful church. That's it. My work is done. When we get into that state, we, 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 we become so content where we're at that the church fails to grow. Finally, in God's word, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. What does this mean? Literally, what he was saying is, you had kicked me out of my own church. You can't knock on the front door if you are already inside. Remember now, Jesus is talking to his church. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anybody has, he didn't say if anybody had hearing. He said, if anybody has ears, let him hear. In other words, he didn't say, I'm asking the pastor to let me back in. I didn't ask the first elder to let me back in the church. I didn't ask the head deacon, the ushers, the greeters. God said, if anyone has ears, 
Let him hear. He's calling on everybody in the church. He's hoping that somebody would let the Lord in and let him have his way. Why is it important to let him in? Because if you don't let Jesus in your church, your church is a dying church. What are signs of a dying church? I'm closing. I told you I ain't going to be here long. Let me give you the signs of a dying church. When Jesus is not there, you have a dying church. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you this now before I start. This is from the Lord. When any type of change is met with fierce resistance, your church is dying. When the members are intensely preference-driven, your church is a dying church. When we are more concerned about creating cliques than a community, you have a dying church. When the focus is on the past and not the future, you have a dying church. When the members idolize another era of the church, you have a dying church. When the presence of God is missing in the assembly of the saints, you have a dying church. When the power of God is not manifested, you have a dying church. When the word of God is presented without authority or anointing, you have a dying church. When every church service is predictable by the minute, you have a dying church. When there is no pattern of disciple making, you have a dying church. When we are more concerned about adding members than we are about creating disciples, you have a dying church. Can I come a little closer this morning? When people are jockeying for position and title and authority and don't have the presence of God upon them nor the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you have a dying church. Can I come a little closer? Don't shoot the messenger. When being a good Adventist trumps being a good follower of Christ, you have a dying church. When the church starts to become a service and not a movement, you have a dying church. When the church rarely prays together, you have a dying church. When there is no divine sense of mission and purpose, you have a dying church. What does that mean? That means that if you don't know why you come into church, you have a dying church. Let me tell you something. If you just come to church because you want to keep the Sabbath, you have a dying church. Come on, somebody. When the church has no clarity of why we exist, you have a dying church. Can I come a little closer this morning? When few people volunteer to do anything, you have a dying church. Can I come a little closer? When few people support.
support the church financially and expect just the church to grow by osmosis. You have a dying church. When the church exists in a community and the community is not impacted by your church, you have a dying church. A preacher once told me, he said, listen here, pastor. When you go to minister at a church, the first question you need to ask your board at board meeting is if this church closed tomorrow, how many people in the community would care? Finally, when your relationship with God has turned from daily dates into weekend rendezvous, you have a dying church. If we as a community of believers only reserve a time to spend with Jesus Christ on the weekends, we need to shut the doors. Lock up the church because the church don't start here. It starts at home. And if you come here for Jesus Christ, that means that there's a problem at your house. I wish somebody would catch that. But if you come here for just your weekly placebo, if you don't know what a placebo is, it's a drug that does nothing. You come here, you take the drug, but it has no effect on you because you're coming with no purpose. I wish somebody would catch that this morning. If you come to church and your expectation is that I am just going to have this one experience with Jesus Christ, it's not an experience you're having. It's an hallucination. Your relationship with Christ should be something that's carried over from the week. I wish somebody was with me. You should be bringing the Holy Spirit. Mm. If you think, if you think that when you come up in here, that the Holy Spirit just resides here and don't go nowhere else. You have a problem. You have a serious problem if you believe that the Holy Spirit is confined to the four corners of this building. Your Holy Spirit should be with you on the way in. Jesus said, I'm going to spew you out because what you're giving me, excuse my language, is trash. Jesus said, you are physically making me sick by what you're giving me. First question I ask you is, can you imagine a church that makes Jesus sick? Are we going to be that church? I hope not. Problem with Laodicea is they kept saying how great they were. My God. They kept saying we have everything that we need. Not once does it say in the scriptures a description from Jesus Christ to them saying that we needed Jesus. A church that is not dying, a church that is healthy, is a church that understands that they need to be under the lordship and the authority of Jesus Christ daily. You cannot depend on the Jesus that started a church and the relationship that started a church to sustain the church. That's biblical. You know that? Look at the disciples. They walked with him f during his entire ministry. Jesus died and they were ready to give up that day. You with me? Then Jesus came back 
and they still didn't get it. Are you with me? Then Jesus had to leave them so they would understand what it's like to be without him. Then when they were hungry and thirsty for what Jesus had given them, that's when the Holy Spirit came. Are you with me in the New Testament? Are you with me? The disciples didn't get it when they first started. What does that mean? Stop holding on to church history or when the church first started. Because they didn't know what they was doing anyway. Let me ask you a question. What the church doing now? We hold on to history and tradition like it was a godsend. And what God is saying is, I did that yesterday. I'm trying to do something new today, but you're blocking me. Mm -hmm. My brothers and sisters, you cannot get comfortable in church. You cannot be comfortable of where the church is right now. Where is the church going? Laodicea is a church that don't exist no more. You do realize that, right? Because they did not heed the warning of the Lord. He told them what was wrong, and he told them what to fix it with. And instead, they kept doing what they knew how to do, and that's play church. You're getting a dangerous territory when you start to play church and stop being the church. Let me read this to you. Stagnation can lead to destruction and the death of God's church. Stagnation can lead to the destruction and death of God's church. You cannot be comfortable where you are. Get up and do something new. Some of the most deadliest demons that can come into a board meeting is the demons that whisper in somebody's ear. That's not the way we used to do it. Some of the deadliest demons are the demons that whisper in somebody's ear. That's not the way it's done. That's, you are allowing the devil to come in and destroy your church from the inside out. Your church can't grow doing what it did yesterday. If the world changes, the church has to adapt to meet the needs of a changing world. We have to adapt. Otherwise, the church will change and die. Nobody wants to ad attend a dead church. I've been to quite a few. It is the most depressing thing you will ever see. I went to a church in North Carolina. A friend of mine asked me to go and preach, and I was prepared to get up and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I got there, there was five people in the church. The church could seat 200. The church was in the middle of a community. Church was bigger than this one. Five people. I said, what happened? Nobody could tell me. But then when I walked into the fellowship hall, the fellowship hall had been lined with photos of years past. The glory days of when the church first opened and all the pastors that have pastored through here and all the members that had been there. And I said, where are they now? 
Nobody could tell me. When you get stuck praising God for what God did yesterday, you will miss what he's trying to do today and tomorrow. That's not just in the church, that's in your personal life. God is trying to do some things in your life, move you forward, progress you, and let you reach new heights, but you've been holding on to yesterday. God says, I want to open new doors, and he says, the problem is you've been standing in the doorway of what I did yesterday. And you can't go through another door when you're stuck at this one. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to help you out today. I wish you would understand what God is trying to tell his church. He doesn't want you to die. Grow. Stop getting comfortable seeing the same faces every week. When we get comfortable, we turn the church into a social club. An expensive one at that. The treasurer will tell you it's an expensive social club. Membership fees are going up. The lights need to stay on. The air needs to stay on. We need to be able to come in and come out. And if all we're concerned about is worshiping God one time a week, we're dying. Where is the people of God reaching more people? Where is the people of God doing new things in the name of Jesus? If you look at the ministry of Jesus, Jesus didn't do the same thing twice. Mm, I wish you would catch that. I never heard him heal the blind multiple times by taking up mud that he then spit in on the ground and put it on somebody's eyes. I've never read it that he did it twice. He used the methods he needed for the times that he was in and the location that he was at. And if the church would understand that you don't have to do everything the same way every single time to grow, then we, our church would expand. You look at these, these mega churches, these big churches, church plant. I, 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 I watch there's, there's a series of churches, and they just planting churches everywhere. And every two seconds, by the time you blink your eyes, that five-member church is turning to thousands. Then they're looking for a building. Because they're meeting the needs of the people where they're at. But help me, Jesus, Sister Burton, you're going to have to come catch me. But we're so busy having requirements to save souls. You can come to my church, but take off the jewelry. You can come to my church, but you're going to have to change this up. You can come to my church, but you need to change the way you dress first. We have so many needs and requirements to join the social club. That's not a church. You're a social club. When you go to a social club, you better dress. The way they tell you to dress, you better act the way they tell you to act. And when you, help me Jesus, when you start adding requirements from membership to your church based upon stuff we set up, help me Jesus. We become cult-like. Help me, Jesus. It's okay to have standards. Are you with me? God requires us to have standards. God requires us to hold up the standard. We understand, but that comes with conversion. There is a process that happens. 
And sometimes we miss the process and just want to bring people in and throw things at them. We have a standard to uphold as Adventists. I'm with it. I'm a proud Adventist, second generation. But the requirements for me to come into church weren't all of that. The pastor asked me, he didn't ask me, did I wore jewelry? He didn't ask me if I ate pork. Are you with me? The pastor asked me, he said, son, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he can save you? Do you believe that you are living in sin and there's a God who wants to change your life? And I said, yes, my parents wouldn't let me get baptized. They said, he's not ready. The pastor looked at my parents and said, I don't know what you are thinking. But based on his willingness to change his life and allow him to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ, I think he's ready. He understood that there's a process. He understood that you wasn't going to get all 28 fundamental beliefs all in before baptism. And by the way, those of you who want to come to me after the service with, with the church manual, let me address you like this. In the Bible, there was a story about a Savior on a cross. And next to him was a thieving, conniving individual who was sentenced to death. And he looked over to a dying Savior and said, what must I do to be saved? Jesus didn't say you haven't studied. Jesus never said to him, no, you need to go look into the, go look into the scriptures and study this word before you get with me. Jesus said, today, whoa, what a savior, you will be with me in paradise. Today, not tomorrow, not next week, not when you get your life together, today. God is looking for Christians, people who will call upon his name, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, but he's looking for somebody today. I want you to understand something about the thief on the cross. He never gave up thieving. I leave that right there. If Jesus had gold and he could pick it up, he would grab it. He never gave it up. Scripture doesn't say that. He said, Lord, I believe in you. I ain't all there. What can you do for me? Will you be the Lord of my life? It's what he's all saying in that one little center. Jesus said, today, not when you get your life together. Because truth be told, <laughs> truth be told, there are many Adventists that still ain't got it together, but got the nerve and the unmitigated audacity to block somebody's membership into the fellowship because they don't believe that they are good enough to get on in. Jesus accepted everybody, everybody that came to him. 
Zacchaeus was still stealing money out of people's pockets. And Jesus didn't say to him, no, give back all your money that I'll come eat with you. Y'all know Zacchaeus? Sycamore tree Zacchaeus? Short little ugly man? Don't don't let dog go on. Y'all know he was ugly. That's what the Bible say. Bible said he was short, was unattractive, and people didn't like him. That what the that what the Bible say. I didn't say it. Short little man, stucky man. The man was so so short he had to climb a tree just so he could see Jesus. Which is kind of funny to me because I, I assumed there was buildings there. He couldn't have climbed up there. That's neither here nor there. That's just an opinion. I'm just saying. He climbed the tree. Jesus said to him, I'm going to your house. And he was like, who, me? And I can only imagine what the shock of the crowd was because they didn't expect to see nobody in no tree. But Jesus knew, saw him, saw his heart and said, hey, I'm coming over your house. And you know, Jesus never asked him to give back no money. I want you to catch that. I don't want you to miss that. Jesus didn't ask for the conversion. Or you want something to blow your mind? When you have a relationship with Jesus and you have an experience with him, it makes you want to give up your old life. That's biblical, people. Jesus never asked Zacchaeus to do nothing. Zacchaeus said, look, Lord, I know I've done wrong. Jesus never asked him no questions. Huh? He said, I know I've done wrong. I will give back everything I've taken. Without measure, I'm giving it back. Because he had an experience with Jesus Christ. Sister Treasurer, wherever you are, forgive me for what I'm about to say. Hmm. When you have an experience with Jesus Christ, nobody should have to force nobody to give back to Jesus what is rightfully his. Nobody should have to poke, prod, push down, shake together, try to get it all all in. When you don't give and you forcibly don't give because you don't want to give, that means that you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you like it is. You're a part of a dying body of believers when you don't give back to what God is asking you to give back to. God is asking, not the pastor, not the treasurer. Not the first elder, the head deacon. None of us. It's God's church. God's church. You don't have to answer to me at the pearly gates. What is your response to Jesus when you don't give back? What, first of all, what, what is required of you? That's the first part of it. And how much more has he blessed you that you want to give on top of that? Your your relationship with Jesus Christ reflects your giving. Dying churches are churches simply who have not had or has long past had an experience with Jesus Christ. So this message is to help us, help me, help you understand that if we are lacking in an area, that's because we are lacking in having an experience with Jesus. That's from him, not me. This word is from God, not the pastor. What is the state of your relationship? What is the state? 
When's the last time you had an experience with Jesus Christ? Was it only when the music was playing? Oh, let me get more specific. Only when the music you like was playing? Only when the pastor preached a sermon that you could relate to? Only when you were able to serve in the capacity that you wanted to serve in? Only on Sabbath? Only because you're Adventist? Or you belong to another faith organization? Relationship with Jesus Christ has no bounds. He can grab you at any time and anywhere. And if you are open and willing to the calling of Jesus, you can go and do anything he asks you to do. Anywhere. A friend of mine this week posted that she, who is a pastor, resigned her post as a pastor. Whole Facebook went off. Are you leaving the faith? You're going to leave the faith. She posted, the, the, the first post was she left as a pastor. Second post, she said, I'm not asking y'all to leave. She said, I'm going to go do mission the way God called me to do it. She said, my sheep know me. And they can hear me. And they do what I tell them do. Is we as sheep, are we listening to the call of God? Or are we just waiting for the pastor to tell us what to do? She said to us, it ain't what about the, what the pastor said. It's not about what the book says. What is Jesus saying to you today? And that's what you should be pursuing. Many of us miss opportunities, blessings. We miss all types of things because we miss the calling of Jesus. We as a church can miss out on heaven not listening to the voice of God. We as ministers have to especially listen to the voice of God because we are responsible to tell God's people what it is he's called us to tell. And how the, let me tell you how the spirit works. Because a lot of y'all, you know, y'all looking at me funny. How the spirit work? When the spirit of God touches us to speak to you, your receptiveness should be clear because the same Holy Spirit that's speaking to me should be speaking to you. Let me give you a practical example. If a man come up to a woman and say, God told me that you're going to be my wife, the same Holy Ghost that told him should have told her too. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit is not about confusion. That's why the church has to be on one accord. So the same Holy Spirit that's speaking to me should be the same one speaking to you. And if it's not, either something wrong with me or something wrong with you. Because I don't know what spirit you're listening to. Are you with me? And the Holy Spirit never going to... Hmm. Holy Spirit is never going to tell you to do something that's against God's word. If it don't line up with God's word, there's something wrong. That ain't the Spirit of God speaking to you. That is why we have to be in God's word we have to be students of the word to make sure what we're listening to is lining up with what we're reading. 
a lot of sheep go astray in the church because the conflict is not that the Holy Spirit saying something and the Bible is saying another. It's that people aren't in the word to realize what the Spirit is saying is lining up with the word. And people go astray. People learn different things. All this stuff talk about the universe. What? The universe told me. The universe didn't tell you nothing. Everybody all up in these different stuff. You messing up my aura. My aura. Spiritual things make sense. All this other stuff we're trying to explain. People who are not in the world is the people who think that we came from monkeys. And only people with low self-esteem would have to think low enough to think we came from monkeys. Well, I got a question for those people. If we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? You ever thought about that? They gonna say some foolishness like they didn't evolve yet. No, come on, man. Then the same people gonna talk some foolishness, talk about what well, we taught them sign language. I can teach sign language to a lot of different things. That don't mean I came from it. When you're not in the word, you come up with all kinds. You see how the devil try to trick you to think you are lower than low, that you came from an animal? That's how the enemy works. He, he, he distorts. Oh, you came from something, but it wasn't human. Because if the devil can get you to think you came from something lower than yourself, then that distorts the image of God. Oh, I wish you would catch that. Because we were made in the image of God. And Satan's goal is to distort the image of God. So if we came from animals, God must be an animal too. The enemy's ploys at God's people and God's church are strong. And if we fall into them, we will become a dying church. When we allow, this is the last thing I'll say. When we allow our preferences, that's the biggest part of this, to dictate our worship, dictate our mission, and dictate how we give. We've become a dying church. Why, are, why, why is that such a big thing, preferences? You look in the word of God and you see the demise of Lucifer. His demise was not only selfishness, but it was his preference. I want to be like the most high. It's his preference. I want to control things. Me. His preference was his self. Not to be Lord. He didn't want to have lordship over him at all. He wanted to be Lord. And it's interesting that a created being wants to be the creator. That's what we do in worship. Do you realize that? When we put our preferences above the moving of the Holy Spirit, we have then demoted God. We've demoted God and put ourselves as Lord over our own lives and our worship. Mercy Jesus. And then we're just warring with God. And people try to figure out why there's so much confusion in the church. 
there's so much confusion in God's church because there's too many cheats and not enough Indians. And the chiefs are idols we have set up. And God is warring against his own church because his church doesn't look like him anymore. Our preferences have become our chiefs. Our preferences have become our idols. And a lot of times God will allow things to happen in our lives to make us understand that he is Lord of all. And your dependency shouldn't be on self, but on him. A lot of trials and tribulation, and we talk about tests, they only, most of them, most of them are lessons we should have already learned already. Lord, why am I going through this again? He said, because you didn't learn the last time. God, I don't get this. I don't, why am I going through? Because you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. You keep falling into the same mess. And it seems the more times we go through it is the less we get. God is trying to break the cycle. And if we're not careful, we will pass that generational curse, that generational problem, that generational issue onto our children. If you look at the church, the generation above you, are they still, were they still arguing about the same issues y'all arguing about now? There's some churches right now. Some churches, well, I'm from New York. I go to some churches up there. They're still having business meetings after church talking about whether or not there should be drums in church. And we're in the next generation of young people. And they still having these same conversations. We're so busy dealing with materialistic problems in the church, we can't even deal with spiritual issues. That's why people are spiritually dying. We're dealing with so many personality issues and character issues. And a lot of it can be solved by prayer, relationship with Jesus Christ, and intentionality. What is intentionality? I am coming to church. I am going home. I'm having worship. All of this to have an experience with Jesus Christ. Intentionality. If you come to church without an intention, you are dying spiritually. And remember that the church is not four corners of this building. The church is you. So when the Bible is talking about the church is dying, it wasn't talking about a building. It was talking about people. Because people make up a church. The only reason why we're here is because we need something to be in. Oh, I wish you would catch that. That's why I don't understand why people get so hung up on where they sit in the church. You are the church. And when we get hung up, that Satan gets so pleased. When we get hung up on all these small, minimalistic things... And he says, I'm going to tie them up with this so that they don't spiritually grow. I'm going to pit the older generation against the younger generation so that they can grow. Because what will end up happening is the older generation will stay in the church and the young people will leave and the church will die when all the old people die. I'm going to tell it like it is. Satan is smart. He said, I'm going to pit the older ones against the younger ones because they're weak in the faith. And they will give up easily. So if I put them against the young ones, the young ones will leave the church. If the young ones leave the church, there's no one to leave the church to. 
And so the church dies off one by one. I remember living in Florida. And when we moved there in 2001, we had buried about 91 people in a matter of three months. I was a pathfinder, and I remember distinctly because we, it, it was our tradition that we would have the two guards at the casket. So every weekend, we would be at a funeral. Every weekend. It got so bad, I got depressed at school. The teacher had to call my parents to let me see a psychologist because there was so much death. A whole generation died out, and the church was empty. Is that what we want? Nothing to leave the building to. Satan, when we allow him to come in and reside, here's, here's, here's the sad fact. When we allow our preferences and the snares of the evil one into the church, Jesus has to leave. Jesus has to leave because man can't serve two masters. I want you to catch that. When you let the enemy in, God can't reside there. Period. There's no way. We have to be intentional about letting Jesus and Jesus alone reign. Not self and not the enemy. That is a sign of a strong, thriving church. Not how many members are there. Not how many members are there. But the strength of the church is shown in the experience that the people who are in the church have with Jesus Christ. There are some churches that have 5, 10, 15 people that got more spirituality than all of us put together. Because when they get together, the intention is to have an experience with Jesus Christ. And some of them don't even crack open a Bible. They can pray. They can sing songs. They can, they're just intentional. And you see some of these growing churches that pop out of nowhere. And it's because they're intentional about what they've come to do. When this church was started, they were intentional about what they want, but, but because because sometimes the enemy seeps in and causes irreparable damage, people have to find and harbor safety elsewhere. Let not this generation of Goshen or whoever's watching online fall into the same trap again. It's 35 years we've been established as a church. It is time for us to move forward being intentional about having a relationship with Jesus Christ both privately and collectively. And we must band together as a church family to ward off the darts of Satan and his imps. The minute we start to have some confusion or if there start to be an argument, well, somebody needs to get up and say, we praying. Amen. Stop the meeting. Stop the conversation. We praying. The word of God says, if any man has an ear, It is our responsibility. It's not the first elder. Don't call him. He not in the conversation. One of y'all better pray. We can't allow the enemy to win. He already done took up the White House. He don't need to take up here too. He don't need Chicago. But it's our responsibility. 
to step up as God's children and say enough is enough. Let God reign. If you're willing to allow God to be the Lord of not only your house, but this house and every house we reside in on our job with our children, please just stand on your feet with me. Uh, my wife told you earlier, there's some demons up, 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 up in my house when, when, my, when my kids come every week. And we got to pray them suckers up out before they show up. Because they come from different homes and different areas and different things. And they bring in all of whatever they got at home to the school. And every morning, I have the opportunity to stand in front of the entire student body. And all I do is encourage them. In my mind, I pray for them. Because, you know, private school, they, you know, you can't say Jesus. So Jesus is in my mind praying over each and every, all 149 of them. Because in them are future doctors and lawyers and teachers, and the enemy would like nothing more than to snuff them out. And the same thing the enemy want to do to them kids is the same thing he want to do with God's people. Why? Because we reflect who God is. And so what Satan does is he tries to distort the image of God into our preferences. And so then God wars with us. And then we wonder what's going on, why the church is in the state that it's in. Nobody wants to do nothing. Nobody wants to give. Nobody. It's because Satan has convinced us that what we're doing is okay. I'm going to ask for one more call. Y'all on your feet. If you want to be intentional, about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not asking for baptism. I'm not asking about rebaptism. I'm not asking about any of that. You just want to be intentional about what you plan to do with your spirituality. Because remember, the spirit realm has two entities in it. You have the Lord, you got Satan and his imps. And if you're lukewarm, you over down there on the other side. Did you know that? By default, when you haven't decided Christ or Satan, you've chosen Satan. When you haven't chosen Christ or Satan and you've chosen self, you've chosen Satan. So does anybody want to be intentional about who they choose? Would you just come on to the front and we just want to pray for you. Pray your strength in the Lord. Pray that the enemy doesn't have his way. When you want to choose Jesus over religion. Come on, somebody. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Savior, Savior, I just want to pray for you. It, 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 and, 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 and I don't want nobody judging nobody. We all in the same boat. Savior, Savior, Savior. If you would just come and pray. Now, if you want to stand in for somebody who hasn't made their, their decision and they, they're calling on election, sure, please come. I ain't trying to go to an empty heaven now. Savior, Savior, Savior. Savior, Savior, Savior. We call you Savior, Savior, Savior. Your name is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You are my healer, healer, healer. Forever my healer, healer, healer. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We call your name Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We need Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. My Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Every head bow, every eyes closed. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father Jesus, we call on your name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
First acknowledging who you are in our lives. Lord, you're the sun, the moon, the stars in the sky. The breath that we breathe in our bodies. The very essence of you. We claim to overtake every feeble and broken aspect of our lives. Father God, we're in a dying state. Some of us mentally, some of us physically, but most importantly, some of us are dying spiritually because the enemy has convinced us that what we want is more important than your will. Right now, we cast out self in the name of Jesus. We cast out Satan and his imps in the name of Jesus. We cast out our preference right now in the name of Jesus. We pray out and cast out the spirit of stagnation in the name of Jesus. God, we, we pray a blessing of progress in the name of Jesus. We pray a blessing of healing in the name of Jesus. We're praying for a spiritual healing in the name of Jesus. God, we're, we're praying reformation in the name of Jesus. God, we're praying transformation in the name of Jesus. Lord, if you got to break us down and build us up again, God, we call upon you to do it in the name of Jesus. Renew a new experience in us. God, we're crying out to you because we are literally gasping for air, spiritually. So breathe into us the breath of life. Renew a right spirit within us. Bring peace of mind to us, oh God. Bring healing in the name of Jesus. God, Satan is convinced that he has the victory. But in the mighty name of Jesus, we claim victory in the name of Jesus. Knowing that Satan is defeated and God's people will live. God, we, we call upon you knowing that this world is not our home. But you are up in heaven creating a place for you and for me. Lord, you said you would set us upon your throne victoriously. So we cry out right now in the name of Jesus. Whatever is blocking the relationship between your people and yourself, that you would do what Trump's trying to do and break down these walls. Father God, We only call on you but you, because you've called on us first. We only call on you because we look like you. And the only one that can understand us is that one man named Jesus. So if he hasn't come in already, we're asking you in the name of Jesus that you would stop by this little place called Goshen and mend every broken heart, mend every broken spirit in the name of Jesus. God cast out every demon in every home in the mighty name of Jesus. We call for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to come on in this place. Shake us up, O oh God. Shake up our jobs, Jesus. Shake up our homes, Jesus. Shake up our children, Jesus. Shake up our whole lives, O oh God. Until the reflection of you is seen in us. In the mighty name of Jesus. Pour your anointing. 
anointing oil on your people, Jesus. God, we're crying out to you. Because we don't want to die in this world. We cry out, We want to be saved by calling out and believing in a man called Jesus who died for everyone's sin. So Jesus, if we can't ask for anything else, we just pray that we be saved. But God, don't just save me. Save your people. Save their children. Save their children's children. God, go up and down the generation. And wherever there seems to be lack, we ask that you would step on in. Whatever separation there would be from you, that you would come on in and tear down every barrier, every brick wall, every stone heart in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we're calling upon you right now that you would bring about some change in this place. That your anointing would be felt. That miracles would happen. That every broken limb be fixed in the name of Jesus. Every broken heart, every depressed heart will be restored. God, you said come boldly to your throne. So God, we're stepping up. Knowing that if we pray to Buddha, it ain't going to get answered. If we pray to the universe, it ain't going to get answered. But we realize that something happens when we call on the name Jesus. Huh. When we call on the name of Jesus, demons have to flee. When we call on the name Jesus, circumstances have to change. In the mighty name of Jesus, everything that was broken has to be fixed because we call on the name of Jesus. So we pray this prayer in your name. Giving you glory and honor and praise. We give you glory. Not for what you've done. Not for what you're doing. But for what you plan to do in our lives. We give you glory and honor and praise. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. in this house today. 
there's some healing that's happening in this house. Let me tell you something. If you think that this is all that God wants to do, baby, you got another thing coming. God wants to come on in. And he wants to shift the entire atmosphere of what you think he's about. He wants to come in and fix broken hearts. tell you what will happen when you let Jesus in. I'm going to let you go. Miracles, signs, and wonders. 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 Let me let me bring you back to the word of God. Pastor, word of God, check me if I'm wrong. Jesus said to these disciples, greater things are you going to be able to do in my name after I'm gone. When we limit God, we can only do what we think we can do. Oh, but if we get in tune with the Holy Spirit, he said, greater things that I did, you're going to be able to do. When you lay hands on the sick, they're going to get healed. When you walk past somebody, there's going to be healing and transformation that's going to happen because you're in tune with the Spirit of God. Lord of the impossible, Jesus, Jesus. Lord of the impossible, Jesus. Jesus. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of doing church. I've been intentional. Anytime you see a flyer, it says worship experience because I don't do church no more. I don't do church no more because we, we, we turn church into a plaything. But when we have an experience, something happens. People should be able to walk in here with crutches and wheelchairs and be able to walk out this building screaming and shouting the victory. People, people look at, you know, you know what? In, in, in our church, we have this habit of looking at first day churches and saying, we look at their videos and, and people get up and they're healed and we say, oh, that's fake. They got paid. I wonder if they were saying the same thing about Jesus when he was healing the sick and raising the dead. Oh, these are just actors. But what I realize about some of these first day churches that they've, they've become so in tune with having an experience with God that they're intentional about walking in a building one way and coming up with believers one way and coming out another way, a new way, a right way. And so if we as a body of believers would be intentional about coming into this place and leaving out having an experience with God, you would leave differently than when you came in. You would leave in better, not worse. It's offering time. Now we discussed the symptoms of a dying church. A dying church says that we're a church that don't give because they don't need it. We're a church that don't, we, we are people that don't give because I don't feel like giving. But when you've had an experience with Jesus Christ and realize that I am a living being and I want Jesus to live in me, I give because he's asked me to give. I give because I want to give. I'm not giving because I'm being poked and prodded to give, but I give willingly because he gave to me first. Ooh, I wish somebody would catch that. I wish you would catch that. Because when you're withholding something from God, you don't realize that he gave to you first. What did he give to me first? Breath in your body. Life, health, and strength. 
the ability to talk, walk, and do everything he's called you to do. He gave to you first. So our, our only responsibility is to give back, first of all, what it belongs to him. The second thing is to give according to the measure that he gives to us. Now, here's the problem with that. I can't give to him the measure that he gives to me because his measure is limitless. But God says if you give with a willing heart, don't miss this verse, that he will pour out the windows of heaven. Now, in Revelation, it doesn't really tell us how many windows he has. Ooh, I wish you would catch that one. God said he'll open up the windows of heaven. We have not been able to number how many of those are. And so, a matter of fact, I don't even know if heaven got windows. He said, I'll open the windows, so it must be there. He said, I'll open up. Let me give you this analogy. You know, some of us have doors at our house. Well, all of us have doors to get in. And sometimes when you're moving into a house, you can't really fit everything through the door. Sometimes you got to open up a window to push something through because you can't maneuver through that doorway. So I'm wondering why God said, I, 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 I'll open the doors of heaven. Maybe perhaps the doors are not open wide enough. And so he says, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven because maybe the maneuvering of the blessings have to go through the windows. Maybe he can get more out that way. Maybe he can get it out faster that way. So he said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And, 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 and that analogy works a little bit better because of what he says afterwards. I'll pour out the window from the windows of heaven so you can get a blessing. But unfortunately, you will not have enough room to receive it. Oh, something just excited me, Brother Nick. Something just excited me. We just been riding off the cups of, of, of the blessings that we can actually handle. The blessings of God that we've been receiving right now is all that we can handle. Do you know what that means? God wants to give us more, but we can't handle it. So it's giving time, church. God wants to do above and beyond what you can think or imagine and what you have a capacity for. So as the ushers come forward, just keep that in mind that God has blessings and you've just been riding on the tops of the blessings of Jesus. You've just been riding and cruising the waves of what you can handle. It's interesting when you look at the word of God, you see that prayer of Jabez where he says, enlarge my territory. So all I'm going to ask God for now is, Lord, would you just open up my resources so I can receive more? I've been asking for more blessings, not understanding that he's been sending them. I just don't have room for it. Brothers and sisters, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your promises. For you know, So we know that your promises are true. We ask, oh God, that you would bless that is given. Bless those who don't have to give, Lord. Open up their resources so that they may receive the full blessings that you have in store for them. And we promise to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise due your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We cry Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sing it now. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We call you Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We need you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We need you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have you way, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have you way, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Send your rain, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Send your rain, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
serve a mighty good God. I don't know if you believe that or not, but I, I, I think that we serve, we still serve a God who performs miracles, who does some mighty things. Just, if I may testify for one second of the power of God and the mighty power of God. I'm standing here today clothed in my white right minds because of the mighty power of God. For the past few weeks, days, months, whatever weeks, the devil tried to really get me to give up. There was such a heavy cloud over my life, over my shoulders since I lost my mom and Went from that to an evangelism series. But after I came back from preaching for three weeks, I sunk so deep. And I really didn't realize what was happening to me. And my wife will testify, she'll tell you that I, I was a strange person for a few days. But God. I said to her last week, I said, you know, I, I don't want to preach anymore. I don't want to pastor anymore. I just want to let this go and do something else. So because the church, you worry about the church, and it seems as if I was losing everything. Lost my mom, and then you know, the church is not doing as you want them to do, and you think that they should be doing, and... And so all of this thought started to crush my mind. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I think that's what depression looked like, and that's what depression sound like. It was difficult for me to get one foot before the other. I'm talking real story here for today. I cry when I don't want to cry, and I can't stop myself from crying. I have no control of anything, and I was just not doing well. Yesterday, I think I was even at my worst. Moved from one funeral to the next. And, you know, I normally get my stuff together before the Sabbath, what I want to be wearing, my suit. And I say, you know what, I don't even want to be bothered with that. Literally pushing myself to keep moving forward. But I say, but God. Got on the prayer line last night and you know there's some faithful prayer warriors in this church. And I shared with them how I felt. I don't even know why I did it because you know as a pastor you got to try to be strong and you can't let people see that you're struggling. And that's a lie, yeah, that's a lie. But you feel that, you know, you, you got this together. You... Now, you know, when you get to the point where my son came home Friday and his mom asked him how was his emotional health. And he started to talk about the depression that he was going through through the loss of his grandmother, the loss of his grandfather, the loss of a cousin, all. So I shared that with a prayer team, and we were about to read our book, and I started to read, and then I guess the Holy Spirit place in Jeanette said, no, 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 don't let's read tonight. One of the prayer warriors said, we're going to pray for you, Pastor. Inside, I'm saying to myself, that's exactly what I needed. I'm on my knees and they're praying and everyone is praying. By the time they were maybe prayer number three or four, I was delivered from that spirit of depression. 
I literally felt the weight lifted from my shoulders. Jesus heard and he answered. So, so I'm standing here today just to let you know that we serve an awesome God. I'm standing here today to let you know that prayer is what's going to get you through. Sometimes you can't even pray for yourself. Sometimes you need the saints to pray for you. And you need to get in the atmosphere where prayer is being heard. And I know that God answers prayers. So I feel better today than I did yesterday. And so I give God praise. And I give him praise. for what he has done for me. So I don't know about nobody else, but I know what he has done for me. I have never experienced what I experienced over the past few days. But when I was at my lowest, God stepped in. The burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus, not anybody else, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Completely delivered. Completely saved. I know my Redeemer liveth, and I know that he is able. Because he did it for me. And I'm just here to testify. I'm aware and I know that we're living thank you we're living at a time when the devil will use anything any circumstances, any situation just looks for a crack in an armor and he comes in and he uses it to destroy you. And I know what that feels like. But I'm so thankful that God hears and answers prayers. And I'm so thankful 
that the prayer warriors were listening to him and that they were able to pray. I lost a colleague of mine uh, in the Adventist faith. Uh, she gave up and walked away from, the, from her pastorate. She said she don't want to pastor anymore. So we just got to keep on praying for each other. Got to keep encouraging each other because you don't know what each other is going through. So if we don't hold tight and hold strong with each other, we might lose a few people. So I just want to encourage, encourage you with a testimony today. How good God is. How good God is. How good God is. All right. I want to share a few things. It will never, never, never lose. It's power. The blood that Jesus shed for.
is about the power of God. This is about the power of a living God. This is about a God who loves his children. This is about a God who will go to have been and will continue to go to all legs for his children. Why? That's why I praise him. That's why I can give him praise. not to um, share this with you. Uh, a pastor's testimony is very powerful. We have been on the prayer line since January. So nine months, over nine months. And we've seen miracles happen. We've seen people change. We've read from books and we've learned more and more about God and about ourselves and our, con our own condition. And it has truly been a blessing. And it has made me realize that God knows. He knew that we would need this at this time, for such a time as this, Hallelujah. when Pastor, who had experienced so much loss, that his sheep, would be able to hold him up because he's always holding us up. And he has been, God has allowed him a space to prepare us for him. We give the credit to God. And it wasn't that we needed to be reading. We needed to be praying. It was, it, it was so loud and clear from the Holy Spirit that our pastor needed the support of his church and his church family. And so I just want to say that God knows. God knows what this church needs. And he will see us through. And he is going to see Pastor through all that he is going through. And we thank you, Lord, and we thank you, Pastor, for allowing us to have this prayer line, to be coming together and be speaking because... During the week, I was having an interaction with uh, another church member, and she said, what are you going to do tonight? And it was such a busy week. And I said, I'm going to spend time with my family, and then I'm going to be on the prayer line because I need God, and I need my church family. I need prayer. And it is truly that we lift each other up in prayer and that miracles do happen. I just needed to say that so you all are aware. And if you're in need of prayer or you're in need of closeness with your church family, you can join us. Thank you so much for sharing that. Just two brief things I want to um, bring to your attention. Next weekend, next weekend, we're going to um, have a good time. Dr. Colin Ross is going to be here. He's coming from California. And he's going to be here on Sabbath. So we, we're we going to have Friday night, but I'm not going to do Friday night. We're just going to have all day Sabbath. We'll take the Sabbath school time. So you want to be here from Sabbath school time. Uh, some of the things that he'll be addressing throughout the day in his in the seminar, he's going to be addressing um, 
let me just pull my little notes up here. Uh, yeah, he, he'll be addressing depression and suicide. He'll be addressing uh, cancer. Why, why is it so prevalent? He'll be addressing one of his topics is uh, Amazing Grace or Blues Music, which one appeals to us? And so he, he's ha there's something for teenagers, something for everyone, different topics, especially he'll be really talking about depression and, and suicide. So I want you to encourage somebody to come because it's so, so prevalent in our society these days. And we want to be a church that's relevant to what's going on. And one of the topics you'll be addressing also is why is it why people find it so difficult to to be in the house of worship on a regular basis. I want to hear that one. I really I'm looking forward to hearing that one. So, but if you've met he was here last year or the year before, Dr. Ross is a very deep very um, well sought off physician in California and you want to invite somebody to come with you. Invite a young person. Uh, we begin at 10 o'clock that, that Sabbath, next Sabbath. And we're going through, have a lunch, a lunch break and then we'll come back in for the rest of his presentation. So I want to encourage you to invite somebody to come that you know need to hear the word, hear the word from the Lord. Also, we have Coming up in November, November 8th through the 23rd, we have our revival, evangelistic revival coming up. And I want, listen, the only way anything is going to be a success is if we invite our folks. You know someone, someone that needs to hear the gospel. And I'm just asking that you invite one person, at least one. So we have some invitations, some personal invitations now, I want you to get, take one or two home, and you can write their names here, and you can just give it to them. Let them know that you're personally inviting them to come. It's going to begin in the November 8th, Friday night, November 8th. Uh, we'll go through the 23rd. So Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and Wednesday night. Those are the dates. Those are the times. So please invite somebody. We need to spread the word so that we can let, so Jesus can come back and he can come soon. Uh, so those are the two things I really want to take a flyer, take one. We have some personal ones you can give. There's some that you can just give out. And we have some, some others that's in my office. I'll bring them out. That is more personalized. You can write the individual name. Pray for them. Encourage them to come out. <coughs> excuse me and uh, be a part of what God have in store board members when you remember that we're having our board meetings this afternoon at 5 God bless you and enjoy the rest of your Sabbath Before we have our benediction, I just want to also remind you that we have our family game night. That's next Sabbath after the seminar. So just make sure you bring a change of clothes, bring your games, bring all of that. We're just going to stay at church and have a good time. Is that all right? Amen. Bring your snacks, bring your games, bring yourself, bring your family, bring your friends, and we're going to have a good time in Jesus. Amen. This morning, before I do the benediction, I would just like to say we have some awesome pastors here. Awesome. Pastor Casey brought some, an awesome word this morning. And I am so proud of Pastor Frazier. Be, why? Because he shared. And that's not always easy for pastors to do. And I am so proud of him for sharing and encouraging us. Can we all stand for the benediction, please? We bow our heads. Now may the peace of God be in your heart, the grace of God be in your words, the love of God be in your hands, 
and the joy of God be in your soul and in the song that your life sings. Amen. <laughs>